Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm excited. We have Joshua Boswell, who's one of the top direct response marketers. He is the secret weapon that technology companies turn to for their marketing success, and he's worked with organizations such as Google, Agora Publishing, Perry Marshall, Microsoft, Verizon, and many more. Uh, his copy has brought in tens of millions of dollars for his clients, but the focus, the importance in family for him is paramount, so he builds his work life around family, so I wanted to focus on that. We're going to talk about that. Joshua, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. I appreciate it, and you know, fun fact, some people have a hard time. Uh, I always like to include a fun fact before we get yeah. started with some of the, the great copy advice that you have for people. But this is as interesting as anything I've ever heard. Um, you know, on the theme of family, your fun fact is you and your wife met and were engaged 96 hours later. That's right. And yeah, you have 11 kids. We now have 11 children. So yes, that's right. Tell me about <laughs> that when you met your wife and 96 hours later you're engaged. Yeah. You know, um, I was at a time in my life, marriage was a, was high on the throne pole. And really, to understand the story, you got to go back a little bit. I grew up in a pretty fractured home, some really rough environment stuff. And fractured? I won't get into my sob mean? story. But Yeah. No, I want to talk about it. Yeah. What yeah, do you mean? Um, my... Uh, my parents were divorced when I was nine, and my dad had been uh, kind of AWOL for a few years before that. Mm. Uh, my parents got remarried when I was 10, and they re-divorced each other when, they were, when I was 11. And at that point, my dad disappeared and was gone. We didn't know where he was dead or alive or where he was at for a little over five years. Wow. Uh, in the meantime, um, you know, I had siblings and relatives and aunts and uncles and all kinds of drug problems, abuse problems, sexual abuse, physical, mental, uh, suicide attempts, mental health issues. Um, That's tough but, stuff. Yeah, yeah. It was it was um, it was an interesting way to grow up. Um, you know, it wasn't all bad. There were some great stuff, but it was it was an interesting it was an interesting growing up year. So I, you know, in the middle of all that, I was basically deprived of. A real strong dad and my mom had to work to support we had six children in our family so she had to figure out how to make ends meet for six children so she of necessity wasn't there a ton how did she do that That's you know she um she, <laughs> she did multi-level things she worked for people she uh, she didn't have a college degree or anything when i was a junior in high school she took in elderly people into the home we had three non-ambulatory elderly folks at our home really? bedridden so I changed a lot of diapers, big diapers, in high school. Wow. <laughs> Did a lot of sponge baths. Uh, saw a lot of people pass away in our home when I was at their bedside and uh, dealt with death. And that's emotional. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. So why did you not get into nursing or something? <laughs> well, I didn't like changing his diapers. I was like, <laughs> I yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, How do you think that changed you by growing up like that? You know, one thing that it did for me, well, two things that it did for me. One is uh, I saw the the impact that um, bad family relations had, and I had an intense desire to sort of break that chain and have just an incredible family. It was always a passion for me to be an awesome husband yeah. and a great father. Yeah. The other thing that it did is we were always poor. We always struggled. We always fought with the money question. And, uh, you know, secondary to my family passion, I had this huge passion to just solve that problem and not get caught up in, you know, poverty. Yeah. So that was a that was another major thing that happened inside yeah. my head, I think. Yeah, and how do you I want to talk about when you met your wife, but Yeah. But it brings up another question, which is how do you get out of that mindset? Cuz a lot of people who are in who grew up in poverty, you know, have a poverty mindset or you have a role model for whether it's a family or father. How did you Obviously, it seems like you have a wonderful family. You have 11 kids. <laughs> How did you, do you have a role model for being a good dad or a family person? Yeah, I do. And so uh, two questions there. One is, how did I break out of that mentality? The yeah. interesting part about it is, is I spent, and we'll talk some more about this, but for the first 10 years of our married life, I was cognitive of that mentality. 
um, but did not know how to break out of it. And so yeah. we, we struggled with massive financial challenges for the first 10 years. Um, and, uh, and maybe we'll save it for a little bit later, but there yeah. is, there was some really powerful things that happened to me in terms of getting the right kinds of tools to break out of that. And, and I'll show those in a minute, yeah, but yeah. you know, the, the role model thing, there are really a couple things happened when I was in high school, I learned, I was certified as a scuba diver. My best friend and I got passionate about scuba diving. We had an opportunity to go to Hawaii for three weeks. We're like, man, if we're going to Hawaii, we're going to go diving. And so we got certified, and uh, what that did is that in Suda, uh, we were certified, but we lived in Utah. So there's not a lot of great dive spots in Utah. So what we'd do is we'd jump in the car on a Thursday. I won't tell you that we skipped school on Friday, but we'd jump in a car on Thursday. We'd drive down to the uh, L.A. area and San Diego area, and we'd do some dives up and down the coast. And late on Sunday, we'd jump back in the car, drive through the night, and get back in time for school in the morning. Well, I tell you that story because in the in the middle there, from Utah to California, is a little town called Las Vegas. And in Las Vegas was a really good uh, friend of the family that my parents had grown up with and had years ago, you know, kind of parted ways, just moved to different places. Well, he lived exactly opposite of my family. He was wealthy, solid family, great person. And I remember one of the first times we drove through there, we asked if we could stay at his house. And I woke up early one morning, everyone else was asleep, and I started walking around his house. And I saw the pictures that were on the wall, and I felt this, the feelings that were in the house. And then I saw the family get up, the way they interacted with each other, and I was hooked. It was like, yeah. man. So, so I kept my eye on them for a little while. Another big thing that I've done, and, and uh, this is just core to who I am, is I realized that the perfect father, in, in my belief, is God, right? And, uh, and I spent a lot of my time studying the scriptures and trying to figure out how did God treat his children mm -hmm. and what were patterns there and what were principles and ideas. And, right. and, uh, and I've tried to model that substantially in my life. Were you religious growing up? Was your family religious? Um, yes, yes and no. <laughs> Oftentimes I was the only one that went to church. Um, we, we were Mormon church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints. Yeah. And, um, so yeah, it did play it play a role in there, but there wasn't a lot of emphasis on this is what you should believe and this is what you should do. It was just sort of there. So you just gravitated towards it. I did gravitate yeah. to it. Yeah, yeah. And part of it was my best friend's dad, this person that I was telling you about down in Vegas, and a couple other people. I saw that they were really devout in their uh, faith, yeah. and I saw the results in their life, and I thought, man, like I see. I see what the dark side is like, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And just people aren't happy there. They're not happy on the drugs. They're not happy in the divorce. They're not happy in all the different stuff. And I, and I didn't want that. So I, I sort of gravitated toward the religious side because I saw people had better results there from yeah. my perspective. Yeah. No, I appreciate you sharing some of those things because that sounds like just extremely tough times and it's probably hard yeah. to, to even talk about it or remember it. Um, so what about your wife? So tell me about the 96 hours later. Yeah, <laughs> so so I all of that's a background to tell you that I'm super passionate about family and I was looking to get married. I was really How looking to How old were you married. at the time? 21. Okay, so you were, yeah, you were young. 20. Actually, I just, when Margie and I actually got married, I just turned 22. And uh, So how did you meet? So we met on a blind date. And I'll give you the short version of yeah. the story because there's lots of details in those 96 hours. But I have tons of time. Go ahead. Yeah, a great friend of ours. Uh, I served a mission uh, for my church in the Netherlands, so I speak fluent oh. Dutch. Oh, wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Lived there for a couple of years. And there was another missionary there, a, a, a sister, a girl. And uh, I, I, um, when I got back from my mission, I was living in Provo. Margie was going to BYU at the time. And uh, this girl had met Margie, knew me, and she started having dreams about setting up Margie and I on a date. Huh. This is a true story. Yeah. And, uh, and at the time, both Margie and I, my wife and I, my now wife, um, were both dating somebody else very seriously. In fact, I was close to being engaged. Wow. And on a Thursday night, we both broke up with the person we were dating. And that same night, th this girl it was had just this, That was a coincidence. It was pure coincidence. Okay. We didn't know each other at all. Pure coincidence. We did not know each yeah. other. Thursday night, um, we uh, both broke up. On that same night, this girl had the same dream about getting us together. She had had this five or ten times. So I got a call the next morning, and she said, I know you're seriously dating somebody, but I keep having this dream. It won't leave me alone. It's driving me crazy. 
I got to connect the two of you. And I said, well, good, good news. I'm like not dating this girl anymore. Anyway, the rest, so to speak, is, as they say, is history. We went out um, that Friday night. We went out on Saturday. We uh, spent time together on Sunday. We did not see each other on Monday. And on Tuesday, we got engaged. And uh, oh two, two, two so, and a half months later, we were married. I mean, so how long were you dating the other person before Margie? Um, about nine months. Yeah, so obviously you dated them for nine months. So what was it in this 96 hours? You know, um, I had done a lot of dating before. I had made lots of lists of what I really wanted in a spouse. And uh, Margie just hit every single one of the things on the head. Yeah. Of all, again, I, I'm super religious guy and I really believe God answers prayers and I just felt an overwhelming directive as it, it were from God that this was meant to be. Yeah. 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 So how'd you convince her 96 hours to marry you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was awesome. There's she one thing be... that you knew that, but another thing that she doesn't get freaked out because of it. Yeah. So, uh, on, <laughs> on a Sunday night, well, I guess it was now Monday morning. We had, we had stayed up late about three o'clock in the morning. We were talking. And uh, I said to her, I said, I got to ask you a question because I was totally infatuated. I mean, I was completely head over heels at this point, right? And I said, What's the matter with you? She said, What are you talking about? I said, Why aren't you married yet? You're like perfect. And she says, Well, it's not for lack of trying because I've been proposed to eight times. She had had eight other people literally propose to her, what? and she had turned them all down. And uh, so on Tuesday night, um, the story gets better. Oh, yeah, <laughs> the story gets better. There's a lot of cool details, but on Tuesday night. We were sitting on the couch together, and she said to me, she said, man, this has been the most wonderful day of my life. I don't ever want it to end. And I said, like out of the blue, I said, um, you know what? Marry me, and it doesn't have to. We'll just stay together forever. Wow. And she said, okay. And I went, whoa, wait a minute. Wait, 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 <laughs> wait a minute. And I got off the couch. I got down on my knees. I took her hand, and I said, no, I'm serious. Will you marry me? She said, I'm serious. I will. Wow. And... Uh, so, you know, she, she just, she felt those, uh, she felt those same feelings. It just worked. It was awesome. Wow. That's a great story. And then you yeah. were married a couple months later. Married a couple months later. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, like every couple have had rocky times, but we've also, um, man, we just, we've had an incredible, incredible marriage. So, so now I have to ask about the 11 kids. How do you manage sure. everything? Or tell me about having 11 kids. Uh, I mean, <laughs> what does that look like on a daily basis? Yeah. Um, so you got to know, too, we homeschool. Okay. So and That's I even work, harder. Yeah. So I work from home. So we're all home all the time together. And uh, it, it's an amazing how it works out. We, um, Margie, Margie's really the magic behind that. She's super organized. Um, but oh, not, have to not obsessively organized, but everybody's got their jobs. Everyone's got buddies. Um, our uh, currently 11-year-old gets up every morning, makes breakfast for the family. Wow. The 13-year-old handles lunch. The 15-year-old uh, handles dinner. Uh, the 8- and 9-year-olds handle uh, some of the laundry. And, you know, so everybody, everybody's got tasks, yeah. and it just, it's just a well-run operation. It's pretty so cool. So tell me all the names. Okay, Esther, Joshua. Are you starting the oldest first? I'm starting the oldest coming up. Okay. Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Esther, uh -huh. Joshua, Jared, Hiram, Isaac, Brigham, Mary, Sariah, Miriam, Enoch, and Eve. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. How do you remember all that? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we, you know, we do, everywhere we go, we do roll call. You know, funny, funny story. One time we, uh, you know, everyone's got I left the kid behind story, but we... When we lived in happen. Montana, we lived about 25 uh, minutes outside of town up in the canyon. And one Sunday morning, we got up, headed off to church, got to church. We're sitting there. About halfway through the service, we look around. We're like, oh, blast. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have 11 at the time. We only had six. We're like, oh, where's Hiram? <laughs> I don't know. So we looked around the church for a little bit, jumped back in the car. I drove back up into the canyon. And uh, he was sitting in the front room. It's like eating candy. Like, <laughs> Hiram, what are you doing? He goes, oh, you guys left me, so I found some candy. I think it was four or five at the time. Wow. Yeah, he's just calm, sitting there. I'm like, oh, man. So that after that, cool. we started head count everywhere we went. Anytime we get in the car, we do a roll call. And um, whenever I need the attention of the whole family, I call off everybody. So it's just kind of ingrained. So what's the hardest part about having 11 kids? 
Yeah, hardest part about having 11 children um, is is always making sure I carve out time for the individual. Huh. You know, because there's, you know, it's not like having two children and trying to spin off an hour or two a week to spend some quality private time. It's, right. you know, it, it's it's a chore. And so, how uh, do you do it? Uh, I actually keep a schedule. I keep a calendar. Yeah. And uh, it's like, and so when I go places, like when I do things for my church activities or business things, for example, and we're, we might talk about this later, but yeah. uh, I'm doing a, a speaking tour where I'm traveling around to eight cities throughout the U.S. over the next couple of months. And my wife and I have planned for take one or two of the children with us to each of these. Um, but I do that a lot when I go speaking or business things, we grab a child. When I run errands, I grab one of the children. When I, um, you know, we've got fr- projects to do around the house, I grab one or two of the children. We, so we just... We try to incorporate it into the daily activities that we do. Yeah. So where are you speaking? Or what is it What is it for? Yeah, it's, it's copywriting. Okay. And it's uh, helping copywriters develop their businesses, um, marketing strategies, business development tactics, those kinds of things. Um, starting off in Phoenix, Tampa, San Diego, Houston, um, Chicago, New York. I'm in Chicago. So, yeah. Yeah. You're, you're up in Chicago? Yep. Hey, well, I'll, I'll, send you the, I'll send you the thing. Come be my guest. Where can it. people check it out? Um, AWAILaunchTour.com. Okay. AWAILaunchTour.com. I'm doing a connection with AWAI. Nice. Yeah. And, you know, I talked, uh, Joshua, about the importance of family and building that around your work. So yeah. how do you do that now? Yeah. So a major focus for me has been on building systems and clients that come automatically and that I can service with relatively low effort. A lot of people are surprised that I, I, I typically work 20 to 30 hours a week and I devote the rest of the time to family and, and uh, church activities. So that's one of the things. The other thing is we have scheduled once a month, we go on a uh, at least an overnight trip together, um, sometimes two or three days. Quarterly, my wife and I go on just a, a mini honeymoon. So you know, three, four times a year we do that. That's great. And then uh, three times a year, we take the family on an extended thing. Like this spring, um, or excuse me, beginning of this summer, we're going to uh, down to Nicaragua. Wow. Uh, we go to Florida a couple times a year. We're going out to California as a family together. Um, we'll go up to Canada this year as well. So we, we usually plan two to three week trips to go just spend time together. Yeah. So what are some of those systems that work so well that other people should be doing? Oh, yeah. Systems. Well... First of all, I try to do things that create residual spinoff uh, revenue. So when I deal with clients and I'm writing copy, uh, I'm doing things that have high leverage activities. So I can write the copy once, there can be royalties backed by it, we can re-leverage it into different products and services. Mm-hmm. So um, one of the things, one of my big mentors is a guy named Perry Marshall. Yeah. He's in Chicago. Perry, yeah. Perry's in Chicago. Yeah. Perry's really big on 80-20 principle that there's, and I call them high leverage activities that you know, you can do one activity and then re-leverage it into lots and lots of other things. And so that's a constant thing on my radar is how can I leverage that? You know, this this tour you could, is a great example. We've done build up to it and sold some things there. We'll record some of it. We'll sell back end products onto that. We'll sell things at the event. You know, so I'm doing one activity and in the middle of all that, I'm spending tons of time with family and I'm getting to see new places and learn about new stuff. So, yeah. you know, it's one activity and it's got five or six other an, uh, ancillary activities around it. Yeah. And you mentioned too, uh, Joshua, that you have clients, kind of a, a system set up to clients come to you. What's, yeah. what's, can yeah. you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, in the early days, my marketing methods was predominantly around cold calling. And there was a big reason for that. I was a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt. I had just bankrupt a company. I had just learned about copywriting. And I, I didn't have any money for basically anything else. Right. And uh, But I had a phone. <laughs> and I could you make had calls. hustle uh, and a phone. You know, unlimited long distance on my phone and I could call. So uh, so I did. And, and, and what, what I did is I focused on... Initially, I focused on large name corporations that I could hit home runs with. Yeah. So some of my first clients was Corel. I did a huge project for Sony. I did projects for yeah. Toshiba. Um, I did some projects for Google. And you know, and so I got all these guys on my resume and my portfolio, yeah. as it were, right away. And what then, made you do that? I want to pause for a second. Yeah, yeah. Because that's interesting because most people 
calling, hustling on the phone, doing cold calling would go, I want to call the mom and pop. I don't, I want to wait till I'm established to go to the Google or the Verizon or the Sony. Yeah. So what made you decide to, to do that? Raw pain. That's what made me decide to do it. What happened is I started off that exact same way, calling smaller fish. And, uh, I landed a client. They paid me $1,000 for a long copy sales letter, which, by the way, now I charge a minimum of $20,000 for. So, you know, you can see the kind of the comparison there. So they charged me $1,000, paid me $500 up front. And then, and then the board of directors of this organization didn't like the letter. The executive director liked it. The, the uh, board um, chairman of the board did not like it. So they scrapped the project and refused to pay me my $500, oh, wow. my second $500. And remember now, I at the time, no income. I'm a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt. That five hundred dollars, you know, six kids to feed, that was like significant. Oh man, it was huge. And I was I was first of all, I was devastated. Second of all, I was mad. I was really mad. And I thought, I don't know even know where I got the thought from. I probably read it in a book or heard it from somebody, but the thought came to my mind, it's gotta be just as hard or easy, whichever way you want to look at it, to call and land big clients as it is small clients and they'll pay me more right. and even if they don't like it my 50 percent upfront fee will be way bigger than 500 bucks right <laughs> right for sure so so i made a decision that uh, i went back and i looked at all my price uh, you know i had a, a, a fee structure i went back and looked at all of it i raised all of it by 50 percent, and i got on the phone with big clients i like it yeah so you know, there's so many things you mentioned, but we'll get into some of the stories. Uh, but I want to talk about some quick wins that sure. people get results with to improve yeah. their copy and sales messages. Sure. Um, I, uh, you know, as you ask that question, really four or five things immediately come to my mind. So let me just let me just start at the top and sort of give a hierarchy and tell go a couple ahead. stories, yeah. and then you can you can interrupt me as we go. Yeah. But. So the first one that I find is I used to believe that the very best copywriters were the guys who wrote the best copy. And what I found was is that's only partially true. Those guys write really great copy, but I found that their secret, like the little, the, the dirty little secret they've got in their bag is, is what they're really awesome at is picking the right products. And you know, this sounds funny, but if you go back and read uh, scientific advertising, for example, he talks about trying to sell razors to Orthodox Jews in Russia, like they don't shave. Like you, <laughs> you won't. You're not going to convince them to buy shaving cream and razors. It just it just doesn't happen. Right. And and so you know, picking the product and matching that up is a huge major thing. So let me give you an example. Yeah, I'll give you two quick examples. Yeah. Um, as I'll talk about later, probably I'm not that awesome at a, as a financial copywriter, writing for financial newsletters, services, advisories, or whatever. It's just financial is not my big deal. But I came across a guy named R.C. Peck who had a legitimate, proven, ten-year track record of getting like twenty to thirty percent returns on his investments. Which, if you follow newsletter subscription people and and advisors, like you know most financial advisors will say, hey, you know, I can get you three to five percent. Awesome ones get you ten percent. Right. Well, I realized this guy, this would be a no brainer to sell this. So he and I created a product called the Silicon Valley formula, which basically detailed his strategies. Mm -hmm. His name's RC Peck. I think I mentioned that. Yeah. And, uh, and so putting together a package, a sales funnel for this product was, was a no brainer. And so I peddled it around to a bunch of the other financial newsletters as a joint venture. And we were literally getting 20 to 40%, depending on the list we were going after, conversion rate, not opt-in rate, conversion rate. Wow. And it sold hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, hand over fist profit margin for both of us. And, and it wasn't because I was so smart. No, it's because I picked a killer product. Um, last summer, I did the same thing. Bob Bly is one of the most recognized copywriters in the industry. Sure. He's got like 85 books out there. He's super well known. He's awesome at marketing and business development stuff. And uh, he approached me about writing a sales letter for him selling a live event. Well, that was a no brainer, right? And so putting, making a good selection of the yeah. core product was very important. So the quick win, if you look at whatever industry you're in, you know, you, you need to find what's the sweetest deal you can offer that's right. legitimate, that's core, that's killer. Right. 
and the marketing will flow from there. Yeah. So that's, that's my first suggestion. Let me ask a question about that. I like that. So the offer, it's a no, something is just a no brainer for someone. So totally. how did you find the Silicon Valley formula or did you uh, coach it out of him and, and put together the product? Um, no, he had, he had all, you know, a ton of these systems already in place that he'd been using for years. And why I called it Silicon Valley formula, um, I, I was actually, I was referred to him because I was trying to hunt down somebody that understood head trash related to money. Because as we talked about, I had a lot of head trash related to money and I wanted to help someone unscrew that and get it out of my head. And I got referred to him through a chain of friends and friends and friends, the yeah. old, uh, you know, six degrees of separation. Yeah. And uh, so he and I, I, I hired him to be my personal mentor and coach for head trash stuff and financial matters. And he did wonders. But in the process, I found out his real core business was consulting with and managing money for some of the largest uh, tech guys in Silicon Valley, oh, like wow. huge, you know, major, major CEOs, CFOs, CTOs. These guys are all his clients helping him, you know, figuring out how to stash away their cash and what yeah. to do with it and how to grow it. Yeah. And I was like, RC. I want some of that. <laughs> you're crazy at this. this. I want some of that. Yeah. And so, uh, and then I, you know, we, we talked and I was like, man, I know people would pay major dollars for this. And so we created the product together. So is it still available? Should people check it out? Uh, I believe so. If you go to uh, RCPEC's website is fearlesswealth.com. Okay. Fearlesswealth.com. Yeah. yeah. We'll send people uh, there too. That sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. RC's a great guy. Brilliant financial advisor. So the first is find that no brainer offer. And what what's the second one? Or is there anything else I'm missing with that? Um no, with the quick win strategies. Yeah, I got I got some others for you. Okay, go ahead. Um th this is one that everybody hears about, and I'm willing to bet less than five percent of most people actually do it, and that is simple A B split testing. Not not complicated Taguchi testing and multivariant testing. I'm just talking about because sometimes that gets too complicated and eh, you know if you if you can do it that's great. But I'm just talking about simple testing. Let me tell you a story. Yeah. One of my clients came to me and had had hit a. Um, they they basically were at five million dollars uh, in annual sales and had capped there. They couldn't push past. They couldn't push past. Came to me and says, "What do we do?" And I said, "Well." What have you done testing wise? Uh, eh, you know, most people, well, yeah, testing's really important. Like, we know we should do it. Okay, well, are you doing it? No. Okay. So, what we did is we created a very simple spreadsheet. Spreadsheet just said, you know, panel A, panel B, what are you testing? What's the control? What, you know, and, and every week we would just test a new thing, get statistically accurate data, pick the winner, move on, pick a different element, move on. I did that for a couple of years. The, the, the immediate result was a 15% lift in profit. So 15, you know, percent on $5 million. That's huge, yeah. Yeah, it's great. So it was like six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000 just popped it right up. So then um, we said, look, just keep doing this. So every single month, month after month, a 3 to 5% improvement on their revenue just because they just kept testing over and over and over and over and over again. And uh, they now are well past uh, the last, uh, they're not an active client for me right now, but the last time I talked with them, uh, they were pushing like 30, 40 million dollars. Wow. Um, they'd expanded in a couple different markets. They're doing great. This particular client's posting uh, pictures of him driving exotic cars all the time. He flips them. So he'll buy an exotic car, drive it for five, six months, sell it, you know, et cetera. Anyway, it's a cool story. I like that story. So, so, so that was another that was another huge win, and it can have an immediate immediate impact if you just simple A B testing. And um, so, let me as a next quick win, let me tell you what you should test. Here's the first, the very first thing you should you're, test. You're exactly what I was going to ask. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. I was, yeah, I was going to ask what what did you test? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so here's the here's the the first thing that you test is list segmentation. Slight different customized messages to two different lists. Okay. Now, here's the deal. Again, going back to Perry Marshall's 80-20 concept. Perry Marshall you know, is a firm believer that not every client should be treated equal, and I have found that to be true. You know, Some people, uh, I'll tell you a quick story here. I found in, uh, in, in fact, I'll tell you two stories. In politics, I used to be heavily involved in politics for a little while. That's really where I cut my teeth on marketing and direct response stuff. And what I found was is that 
when we are doing fundraising, if we send out a, a an appeal letter that asks for 20 bucks, there was a certain segment of the list that would donate $20 every time we mailed to them, right? And if we mailed to them and asked for 30 bucks, we got nothing. Really? But if we asked for 20 bucks, huh. we get 20 bucks. And why? Because they had a psychology that $20 was an okay threshold for them, right? By contrast, we had another segment of the list that if we asked for under $100, we got nothing. But if we asked for over $100, then they would consistently give and give because their their ego was on the line. Like, I, I do not give less. You know, that's $20 is for poor people. You know, I'm rich, right? right. Yeah. And so they had a totally different mentality. So what we did is we broke up the list and we created a structure that was people who would donate repeat, people that were one-time major donors and people that were high-end donors. And, and I won't get into all the specifics, but we created this grid and we segmented out the list and then we started testing. Okay, can we get $20 out of this person every time? Can we bump them, you know, et cetera. So the results was phenomenal. That's was amazing, super, yeah. Yeah. So uh, another quick example. One of the big projects that I did was with Corel. And uh, Corel was launching um, a new software, an update to their um, Paint Shop Pro what was it at the time, 12 or 13? I, I can't remember now. But what we did is we took their whole list and we broke it up into demographic and psychographic segments. We had like 85, 86 segments. And we created a core email that had the core message in it. And then we created some database-driven elements that changed out and customized per these 84 segments, right? So this is very, this is a little more complicated, but and then we sent that out. What Response would be an was, example of like, just to give people an example. So what would one of those messages say that was customized to a certain region? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So what we found is in the list segmentation, we'll give, I'll give you two big examples. Some of the list was focused on photo editing and some were focused on graphic design, right? Because that software will do a little bit of both. We right. did a little bit of the, both of the time. And so we'd have this core message of all these features and things that it did, but would have an opening line that would say, hey, if you really want to impress your friends with your incredible photos, then this is the software for you, as an example. And then the, the second message would say, hey, if you really want to impress your friends with some awesome graphics that really stand out, then this is the software for you. So it's, a, you know, again, so what did we really change? Graphics versus photo. Right, right. But you can see how it totally speaks to a different audience, yeah. right? And we talked about some regional things and would mention certain local cities based on where they're at. And, you know, for example, hey, if you're walking downtown in San Francisco, you know, that little San Francisco bit would swap out for L.A., Seattle, Chicago, whatever. Right, right. Um, you know, so those kind of slight nuances and we tested those and they made a huge difference. So the result was. Um, we had some, we tracked open rates and opt-in rates and some of the open rates were as high as 75, 80 percent. Wow. And we had end conversion rates as high as 20 or 30 percent from opt-in going through the cycle purchasing. So, th I mean, it was stunning. You know, that is uh, stunning. That's huge. Millions and millions and millions of extra dollars in revenue for Corel in that campaign. And it wasn't that hard to do. Um, this was one of your cold calls? Like you just called them? Correct. Corel was one of my cold calls. So yeah, how did that go? Was... Go back to when you first called them. <laughs> <laughs> so I bought a list of executives where I got direct. I some of the uh, some of them had direct lines into their offices, and so I would call after hours because the executives usually stay late and the secretaries don't. Right. Very Di smart. Different, Very different, smart. Yeah. Difference in mentality. Yeah. And, I, and I was already segmenting my list. Right. Filter yeah. out the gatekeepers. Right. So I'd call slightly after hours. Well, Tim Sire at the time was the global VP of marketing for uh, Corel. Uh, and I called him and he answered. And so we struck up a conversation and I found out uh, he's a big family man, loves outdoor sports, especially winter sports. And so we got talking about skiing. I'm a big ski bum. I love skiing. I grew up skiing in Utah. And, and uh, we got talking about, we got about half hour into the conversation. He said, now, what is it you do? What do you call me for? <laughs> hey, Tim. How well, did you get past that first initial minute, you know, to, to actually chat with them? Yeah, great question. Um, my initial response to a lot of stuff, when I called, when I initially called people, it was a very simple script. And that script was, my name is Joshua Boswell. I'm a freelance copywriter. I'm calling to see if you guys hire outside writers. And he said, 
you know, I don't really do the hiring, but, you know, tell me again what you do. And I says, well, I'm based out of Utah. I was in Utah at the time. He goes, Utah. He says, we've been skiing in Utah. I love Utah. And I said, man, I love skiing too. And we went off and was telling me about skiing with my kids. He goes, oh, I got kids too. And then we talked about ice skating, you know, and so, and, and so there, you know, it just, for what, one thing led to another. Yeah. So. That's a he great he dropped a he dropped some bait out there and I picked it up and we just carried the conversation on. Yeah, because that's you know it goes back to just that cold call. Yeah, yeah, it, it was the cold call. And you know if you really analyze what I did there, it's just simple how to win friends and influence people stuff. This is not complicated. You know I'm just I'm focused on him and what they need and what they're doing. This is you know it's not it's just basic human psychology. Yeah. Um, so list segmentation you talk yeah. about, um, yeah. and then you also noted a couple things about frequency and price and product and, uh, the furniture mart. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, another interesting story, uh, had a client called me up and they were bleeding. They, they had, they had started hemorrhaging about a hundred thousand dollars a month in revenue. Wow. So they had gone from a couple hundred thousand dollars a month from revenue and they watched just as their uh, stuff just started tapering off, falling off, falling off, falling off. And uh, so called me up and wanted to know, look, can you help come in and analyze this and fix this? Sure. So I went down, uh, their office was down in Houston. I spent, uh, we spent two days in the office, shut the doors and it went through everything. And I said, you, you've changed something here. What did you change? We didn't change anything. You changed something. Let's go through. I know you've got something here. And um, finally, in the day two, uh, I said, let me see your let me see your promo. Because we're sending out the same number of promos. We're doing the same kind of stuff. And he just emailed it out. And, and I said, you're, you're changing something. There's got to be something different. So I analyzed the things. And what he had done is, the long and the short of it was, he had basically taken... And he had stopped doing sales. He said, I got sick and tired of being the low discount guy. And I wanted to be like more like Apple where we never offer sales and we just you know sell on the value of our product. And I said, you gotta be kidding me. You, like, you can't do that. And so I said, here's what, here's what happened. You have conditioned your list. A portion of your list has been conditioned to only buy when there's a sell. You stopped offering sales, so they stopped doing it. And this is what I call the Nebraska Furniture Mart thing. You'll notice that throughout the world, furniture stores only, everything's always on sale. Right. Right? Yeah. right? Like like going out of business sale, year-end sale, St. Patrick's Day sale, like furniture never sells at full price, quote unquote. It's always on discount. And so John Q. Public is conditioned to only buy when there's a sale. And, and Nebraska Furniture Mart is awesome at doing this. And so, you know, that's why I call it the Nebraska Furniture Mart Syndrome. So what we did is I said, I'm going to prove this to you. So we sat down. I hammered out a email that was very similar tone as to some of his big blowout offers. I can't even remember what we made up. But we said, okay, we're going to send this out. We're going to see what happens. This was close to the late morning, early afternoon. We sent that out. A few hours later, he had $50,000 in sales. Wow. Why? Because there was all this pent up demand. They were waiting like, <laughs> when's the freaking sale going to come? It's been four months. Like no sale, dude. Come on. So, so when you talk about list segmentation, you're going to have a portion that respond to certain types of offers, which is another way to segment your list is a type of offer. So, yeah. yeah. Any yeah. other, and I want to talk about your next one, but any other tests that would be important to talk about? Yeah. Um, I test to talk about. Um, you know, I'm a pretty simple guy. Uh, so, you know, we can talk about headlines and leads. And yeah. I don't know if you want to get into that right yeah, now. Yeah, go ahead. That's a, that's a major, major, like if we said, what's another quick way to win is headline and leads. And uh, I, so when I talk about headline and leads, let me just explain what I mean by testing them. Uh, headline for for an email is typically a subject line, right? So so if you look at traditional long form sales copy, you you open up a page and a letter or an envelope, and it's got a big bold headline, and this comes from the newspaper industry, which of course has to have a headline to sell their papers, right? Of course, we don't sell papers anymore because that's a different world. But um, 
So those headlines and then the lead is the opening paragraphs or sentences that draw people in. The only reason for these two things are to excite people to read the rest of the copy. That's what they're there for. So long and the short of it is, is I have a basic simple formula for how and what I test. And that is what I call the four U's. I stole this mercilessly from AWAI. They've, you've talked about this for years, but the U's are urgency, uniqueness, uh, usability, or is it useful and ultra specific? It's kind of a, you know, it's not exactly a you, but it's ultra specific. So it, what you do is you look at every single headline and lead you have, and uh, let's get incoming call here. If you, think- um, you look at every single headline and lead that you have, and what you do is, is you rate it. Every, every one of those things gets up to four points, then you add the points, divide it by four, and you get a final score. So for example, if I read a headline and it's not urgent, there's no urgency at all to it, right? Like, um, my my cat is very nice as a headline, right? My cat is very nice. There's nothing urgent about it. There's nothing useful about it. it I guess it's specific in that you, you got a nice cat, but how is he nice? You don't know. And and uh, is it, you know, useful at all? Well, eh, you know, there's not a lot there. <laughs> right. Um by contrast, you could say something like, my cat has already lost nine of its lives falling out of a tree. Find out how to help today, right? Or stop your cat from falling out of a tree and save its nine lives or something. You know, like I'm, I'm making up silly stuff here. But you can see you add a little bit of specificity, usefulness, and urgency to it, and it changes the whole dynamics. And you can rate that and score it out. If anything's over a three, test it. If it's under a three, redo it. Just redo the headline and leave now, you can do this with any piece of copy, any subject line, any opening sentence. Is it useful, urgent, ultra-specific, and um, useful? And if it's not, throw it out and write something that is for crying out loud, right? So that's another thing that you can test. And you can test this all day long. Just write a new headline for a different product, swap it out, A, B, split test it, pick the winner, try another one, try to beat your control over and over and over again. Yeah. And Joshua, you have a good PR example. I do have a good PR example. Thank you for the reminder. Um, so, uh, it was, let me think, 2000, uh, I think it was 2008 or so. Google was in the middle, they had just released Google Books, which isn't one of their bigger services, but it's out there. And they were being sued by a number of authors um, for um, copyright violations. And they contended that since they weren't making money off it, and then there's public domain that they could publish a certain amount of it, et cetera. So there's a big battle going on about whether or not Google Books would survive or not. Um, I had a connection that was hired on at Google, and they approached me about writing some PR stuff for this. Most people don't know this, but especially when big companies or public figures get involved with legal battles, what they do is they engage in PR campaigns to try to sway public opinion and thus sway opinion of juries by you know by osmosis juries and judges and and put some political back pressure on these people yeah. um it's kind of ruthless but it happens all the time <laughs> so google engaged in the same kind of campaign to save um uh to you know to save what they were doing well what we did is i convinced them normally pr is very bland and i said look what we need to do is we need to cr- we need to look at everything that goes through here through the lens of the four u's and um, make this urgent and useful and make these headlines and these press releases. And uh, we wrote some talks that people were giving at local venues and articles and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I says, we just scrub everything through the four U's. And we did a huge effort, a huge campaign to do that. And the result was crazy. Before that, they were getting almost no traction. After that, when they started writing these great human interest stories and, you know, things that were useful and urgent, all that kind of stuff, they just changed their headline and leads with the same basic message and content, and the result was nuts. Um, the, you know, they were getting articles all over the thing. They won the case. It, it, the PR campaign won. <laughs> it was very effective, and it turned out to be a great campaign for them. So, Joshua, what was one that strikes you that you remember being uh, maybe the most fun, or or one of the ones that you liked the most? Oh, on the headlines that we did. Yeah, or the oh, the yeah. articles itself. Um, one of the things that one of them was was an appeal to authors themselves. A few of the authors that authors that were in the lawsuits were making the claim that um, 
that this would destroy their book sales because you could go on to Google Books and, and find their books and read a digital version of it, right? right? And so we wrote, a, we wrote a series of campaigns and the underlying message essentially was have Google promote your book for free to their you know, X amount of billion customers, whatever that number was. And so we had a very specific thing. So it was useful. Uh, it wasn't That's super huge. Pertinent. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what know, author is not going to want that? Right, right. Yeah. And, so, uh, and so we then made the case that, look, this is going to hurt your sales. You'll have excerpts in here. People start reading the book, want the rest of the book. They can click on buy it right there on the side, and it's a done deal. So, um, um, so what we did is we got some author guilds and some other people picked up, saw those articles, and went berserk about this lawsuit was going on, and it raised awareness, and, and it was a big part of the win. So I like that. Um, okay. So you talked about the right. offer, the A-B testing, yeah. the list segmentation, so, the headlines and leads. Let's talk. Yeah. So can I, I just want to talk about one more quick one. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I, we could probably talk about more, but let me just talk about one other. The, uh, it, so in my world, my world for the most part is direct response, meaning I'm trying to reach through the computer and grab people by the juggler or the mail and get them to take action right I now. wasn't going to let you leave this one out, by the way. Okay. Yeah. No, okay. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, in that process of getting them to take immediate action, most people make a huge, huge blunder because they don't understand the psychology of what happens inside people's minds. And what happens is, is as soon as you make an offer, a pitch or something, then an immediate barrier goes up. There's a resistance. The natural inclination to protect ourselves and our money is to say, well, wait a minute, I got to stop and think about this. Now, to understand this, you have to understand what really happens inside the fight or flight syndrome, which is not totally accurate. They say that when you you're presented with an obstacle or a challenge, your response is to fight or flight. And the real truth is the first response inside of human psychology is to freeze and assess data, right? So give you a, a silly example. You're walking through the woods and you've been told there's bears in the area and you hear some loud tromping, <laughs> right? So, so the immediate response is not to immediately start running or turn around and pull out your gun and start shooting into the woods. The immediate response is freeze and listen carefully. Like, right. okay, I'm going to look around. I'm going to start assessing what's going on. I'm going to gather data. What do I need to do here? Do I need to run? Do I need to shoot? Do I need to, what is, what's got to happen here? Do I need to break out my can of, you know, bear spray? Like, what do I got to do? Right. right. Um, and so the immediate response in, in buying is always the same as well. As soon as I say to you, hey, I've got an offer, your immediate response is freeze Put up a wall and start assessing information. I got to protect myself. What am I going to do? What's really going on here, etc. Okay. So what most people try to do? Yeah, is I never thought of it like that, but yeah. Oh, that's exactly what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what most people do is, is they get to the point in whatever they're offering, whether it's catalog copy and it's just tiny little thing, whether it's in emails, what, whether it's a live presentation, whatever the case is. They get to the point to where they're making the offer and then they make the offer and then they just start pounding on the offer. They close, they reclose, and they reclose. And, and what happens is every time you do that, another brick goes on the wall because you're, you're still trying to assess and defend your position, right? So the strategy on this is a combination of a false close and then a real close with a you know what I call a demilitarization effort in between. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so what happens is is you have a very clear offer, you give a price point, and so immediately the wall comes up, and then you do a sleight of hand and you walk around the wall and you come up shoulder to shoulder with the person and you go on a journey with them somewhere. You you change positions with them, and by changing positions, you're 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 stepping around the wall and you're going and partnering with them. So how this works is I usually tell a story. So, um, you know, this, you know, this widget's going to be $2,000 and here are all the benefits and this is all the stuff they're going to get with it. Wall. You know what? Let me tell you something about a friend of mine. So they're thinking, Hey, well, they're going to ask me to cough up the credit card and pay. Instead, he just asked me to tell, he's going to tell me a story about a friend right. And so now mentally you're going, wait a minute, I thought we were just talking about a sale, but now we're talking about a friend. <laughs> and so, so what happened right. to this friend is, is that, you know, he, he had this problem and he was working on this thing and he found out that he couldn't overcome it. And then he saw this widget 
And, you know, even though it was $2,000, gosh, the widget like totally helped him out. Can you see this guy? Like it really helped him out and it was a really cool deal. And hey, you know what? I think it, I think you can do the same for you. And so let's do it. You, you ready to do it? Okay, let's do it. And so now you're behind the wall. You're with them in a certain space. You've told a story to engage them and bring them along. And then you say, okay, now let's take action and buy this because don't you want the same result? or the same benefit, or this extra bonus, or whatever it is. Now, so, you know, quick story here to help you understand how that works specifically. One of my clients, St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, and um, they approached me for fundraising efforts, obviously, and their, their typical sales or, or fundraising letter, their appeal letter, went like this. On the first page, they had, you know, if you can make a donation of $20, $30, $50, and then at 20, you know, it's like four or five times they had this ask with not a lot of stuff in between. So the the reader, the donor, was just like, you know, constant like machine gun getting hit with this. So I said, okay, let's go down. If you're if you insist on on making that appeal right up front, let's go ahead and do that. But then let's tell a story and talk about you know something heart wrenching that happens inside of St. Jude's. I'm sure there's a million stories I could tell. Gazillion yeah. stories. Yeah, they're an incredible organization. I mean, they're just phenomenal with the good they do. So, so and then and then we'll come back with a stronger, more clear appeal at the very, very end and close out the letter with a strong push and, and uh, you know, kind of putting your arm around them and walking with you through this experience. And the result, so we did that. We changed up this appeal. It was a control for them for years and years and years. And I, I, uh, I say this very proudly. It had the had the great distinction of of single handedly raising uh, their high you know their their average donor amount right so so the letter got a slightly less volume but we almost tripled the size oh. of their average donation and so the revenue the, the donations was exponentially bigger than what they had had before on this particular uh, sequence and series and when what what changed it, what changed was just the way that we presented the close that was it. That was it. So I love that story, Josh. When you're a good storyteller, how did you realize that stories were so important? Oh, and how did you learn to tell those stories in a, you know, a beneficial way? Yeah. Um, I realized that stories were important because I love stories. I, I grew up loving to read. Yeah. And, and uh, my, one of my favorite things that people say all the time is they're like, oh, long copy does not work. We have very short attention spans in our world today. And I say, well, somebody who please needs to call JK Rollins and tell her that Harry Potter is too long and nobody's going to read that thing. Why do they read it? Right. Cause it's a great story. Yeah. It's a great story. Um, how did I learn to tell good stories? I learned to tell stories by reading great stories yeah. and, and intuitively I picked it up. Um, and later I learned things like the hero's journey yeah. and plight of the orphan and, you know, these different elements that come into play. Um, you know, a, a major, major thing is helping the reader become the hero. Why is Harry Potter so amazingly successful is because you take this, you know, basically run down out of nowhere orphan and you gradually build him up into this superstar. You, you take you, you and you and you as the reader are actually Harry Potter going with him on the yeah. journey and becoming studly like he is, right? Yeah, yeah. So what and are so, some of your favorites? Some of my favorite, favorite stories? stories? Yeah, movies well, or books? Yeah, yeah, I love old classic stuff. I just love old classic stuff. For example, there's a, um, an old writer named Jean Stratton Porter. Okay. Um, she wrote uh, um, a book called, I'm trying to think of ones that people would know because she's really, she's, you know, not published anymore. I, you, well, you can still find her books, but um, Freckles, Girl of the Limberlost, um, The Daughter of the Rainbow, um, two of my very all-time favorite books she's written. One's called um, uh, The Keeper of the Bees, and the other one's called Laddie Boy. Hmm. Phenomenal, phenomenal storytelling. And twists and turns and the whole hero journey and, like, hmm. unexpected things that you never know. They're, they're like... And they're packed with values and morals, all of that. Um, I love, um, I absolutely love Victor Hugo and, and uh, his books. He's a great, great storyteller. Um, and uh, C.S. Lewis, I believe, is one of the best storytellers of all time. Yeah. Um, just, you know, just a master at weaving a great story and building characters and, 
and uh, you know all those kind of good things. Any business related storybooks? Yeah, um, I think Andy Andrews does a great job. If you've ever read any of his, he's yeah. got a book called Traveler's Gift, huh. which is really really a good story. Um, one of the best story business books that's out there that probably um, I, I think would radically change anybody's business career if they read it. And that is a book called Leadership and Self-Deception. Hmm. Leadership and Self-Deception. Uh, it's written by the Arbinger Institute. <clears throat> and uh, I don't know who the actual author is. I should find out. Hmm. Uh, it's pub- It's not oh. published under an author's name. It's published under Arbinger Institute. I'll check that out. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, Weaves, a, Weaves a great story. I'm looking at my bookshelf here and looking at other stories I have. Oh, another one. Um, a guy named Chuck Coonrott wrote a book called The Four Laws of Debt-Free Prosperity, which is basically a story, Four Laws of Debt-Free Prosperity, and which talks about uh, money management, which is an hmm. awesome book I've got here. Um, so those are some of my favorites. Yeah, thank got, you. For- you're, not, you're not seeing it, but I got a whole wall of, of books here, so I'm <laughs> looking over my, my books. Maybe my we'll turn the camera around later. But yeah. uh, no, that, I appreciate you sharing that. I'm always looking for new good ones uh, that will help. I like Tell to Win. I don't know if you've ever listened to that one yes. before. Tell to Win is one yeah. of my favorites of all time. Yeah. And uh, Made to Stick uh, with the Heath Brothers. It's one yeah. of my favorites too. Yeah. Um, so we talked about some of the growing – thank you for any anything else. I mean I know you included a lot there um, with the, the five suggestions with the offer, the A-B testing, list segmentation, headlines, and leads with the four U's and the closes and false closes. Um, anything else – with that uh, to mention that we missed? Um, I think it's a pretty good summary. It, yeah, you know, it's fantastic. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I guess I'll say one other thing, and that is um, it, it's not really a, a quick action item for a quick win, but um, it is a huge element of success, and that is simplicity. Mm-hmm. And we can talk about this a little bit later, but yeah. I find – you know, I find that people get so caught up in the new techniques and the new strategies and the new technologies and all this kind of stuff, they forget simple things like, "Oh, I should split test." <laughs> right. Right. So they're That's chasing true. they're chasing these complex, amazing things and all these social media strategies and on and on and on, and they're just not doing the basics. And so, you know, you're way better off grabbing yeah. two or three very simple, basic things, and just cranking those out over and over and over again and mastering them then you are delving into tons of different strategies. And we see companies self-implode all the time doing this, right? They got a core message, they got a core emphasis, a marketing strategy, they get out there. You know, if you've ever read Tipping Point? Yes, um, yeah, Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, Tipping Point, you know, he talks about, um, I believe it was, uh, if I'm remembering the story right, you know, Converse Shoes, and he's like, Hey, these guys, these guys went after a small fringe thing and they were in little nooks and shops and everything. And then they went commercial. They, they like got complicated and forgot the thing in their business, cavitated. Well, because they forgot the simple thing that they were doing that was making them hundreds of millions of dollars and it blew apart their business. Yeah. Stupid. Yeah. Stay focused on the simple things. The fundamentals and simple things. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, Josh, we talked about some of the early days of growing up. Um, so I wanted to talk, have you talk about, and you referenced some of these things, the, what did the early days of your career look like? You said you, you know, the first 10 years were a bit of a struggle. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. So when we first got married, I, um, one of the things that my mom did that I mentioned growing up was she was involved with multi-level stuff and particularly with Amway. And uh, that was an awesome, that was a very, very positive thing for me because she was always listening to tapes and listening and having me read books and and I was listening to these speakers that were positive and whatnot. So I had a dream. I had this huge dream of becoming super successful as an Amway guy. I mean, that was my dream. Like, I'm going to be a multi-million dollar Amway guy. So for the first five years of our marriage, we were heavily involved with Amway. And we did very, I, we did, I shouldn't say we did very well. We did reasonably well, right? Um, we had a couple hundred people in our organization. Uh, I was invited. Yeah. And I, I was invited to speak um, all through the U.S. and Canada at Amway meetings and at some other meetings and huh. talk about some of the things that we were doing. So it was a lot of fun. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the, the organization that we were a part of, the guy that was my immediate upline and, and some of the other things that were going on, and this is, not a, this is not to debase Amway as a company or whatever, but the particular line that I was in was doing some um, – less than ethical things. I, I just, 
and I'm not going to get into what that was, but sure. we came to a point where I had to make a decision as to what we were going to do. And, and we decided to pull out of that whole oh. thing. And you wanted to be associated with that type of thing. I didn't No, yeah. I didn't. And, uh, and it, you know, with my religious background, it's hard for me to, you know, and I was unwittingly for a number of years promoting a lot of stuff that was not that great on the back end. And anyway, I, so I just needed to step away from it. Went from there and started um, a technology company. And at the time, this was the late 90s, and, you know, the Internet was just coming on. And um, my brother and another guy that was a computer programmer had figured out this crazy way of connecting a database to a website to make right. content dynamic. Can you believe? The cutting like, edge it, stuff. Yeah. Like crazy. <laughs> it was nuts so. And so we started a company that, um, and also this will, I always laugh at this. We started a company, we thought, you know, with a database, we can localize stuff, right? So somebody could log on and they could see local ads and see um, mm -hmm. offers from local companies and they could be connected to local communities. So we created a company called Local to Local. And uh, one of the things that we did is we sold custom software packages to merchants so they could customize their database and their web presence. And we sold localized ads uh, centered around these neighborhood communities. And so, you know, Google, Google did a way better job at this than we did. Um, but we had, we were growing but you're very, pretty very early fast. on. That was really early on. Yeah. yeah. It was cool. And uh, so we were growing very fast. We went and got uh, in a, a first round of investing and then we were on tap for a second round of investing. And we were due to sign this second round of investing September 13th, September 13th, which is an important day because our investor had offices in the in New York, in the Twin Towers, and um, September 11th happened. Oh, God. Yeah. And so he, he was not, he was involved with it. He had some employees that uh, sadly lost their lives in that. Yeah. And... Um, and, you know, so he basically said, he says, I got to regroup and he pulled out of the deal, which is yeah. totally understandable. But we had overextended ourselves because we felt, oh, we have this, you know, we, we'd counted our chickens for that. So that company folded and left me in a little bit of debt. I'm surprised. Why did it fold so quickly? It seems like a, a great idea, a good timing is just because that it needed that next infusion of capital or what did you need it for? Yeah. The infusion of capital. We had employees that we had to pay. We had servers that we were running and oh, that's painful. And, that's and to really be totally painful. Yeah, it is. And, and I mean, you know, total transparency is, you know, I was this, I was the CEO and president of the company. I was not that hot at, at uh, managing. We had sell at managing the money. I mean, I just didn't know. I, I was just, I did tons of stuff really wrong there. And it was way overextended and had credit, and um, it was it was bad deal. So, um, you know, if we if we could have got that couple hundred thousand dollars of cash infusion, we probably could have kept it going. But you know, we scrambled for a little while to find other investors. But you know, it's tough when you can't pay. You can't pay, and right. people started to walk, and then I couldn't didn't have the infrastructure, and it, well, that was that was that. So, how many uh, staff did you have at the time? Sounds pretty big. Uh, no, it wasn't that huge. We had um, like 10 sales guys at, um, about as many uh, developers and um, a yeah. couple of administrative people. 20 so to 30 a, people? Yeah. Yeah. So what did you learn from that experience with running the business that yeah. you take down? One of the major, I learned two major things on that. First of all is, is that in, inside of a company, every silo has to pay for itself. So you can't, Expect one, you know, if you have these different divisions and silos, you can't expect one to be, um, you know, propping up the other. You, you really need to make each one a separate entity and pay for itself. That was one of the big things. And the second big thing is cash flow um, is everything in business. You know, you can have you can have contracts out that are going to bring you in tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars. But if you've got uh, expenses that need to be paid right now and can't wait, then you've got this cash flow gap and that'll kill you. And, and a lot of businesses die off cash flow mm -hmm. or mismanaged cash flow. Yeah. Right. So, um, so we just, we just overextended and the cash flow wasn't right. And we just, you know, it was tried to grow too fast. That's a shame. Cause it seemed like a per, a good idea, a good timing. That sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I so, know. <laughs> so what did you do after that? 
Um, I mean, was that a quick recovery or do you just like sit for weeks thinking what, what just happened there? Yeah, no, I did not handle it very well at all. I didn't handle it. I don't it well. think anyone would. Um, we, uh, we, we, it, it was a downward spiral. I, I, I don't know if I went into a clinical depression, but man, I was bummed out. Um, for sure. We, we uh, a few months later, we had our car repossessed because I wasn't managing that very good. Um, we got an eviction notice in the, in the home we were living in. <laughs> um, we ended up moving into my sister-in-law's house. And, um, and that was a hard time. We, you know, we basically, we moved in there and I sort of lost my identity as a father and as a husband, we just got morphed into this other family and we were living in a couple of rooms in their house and, uh, he was very successful. So it was a huge house. It was like, you know, 12,000 square foot house. And, wow. That is huge. Yeah, it is. It was a big house. Yeah. But, you know, and so he said, ah, oh, we'll come and give you the West wing and, you know, the but, West wing. but still, you know, it was, but, but I basically, you know, it, it was hard. I didn't have an income. I was yeah. mooching off an in-law. Yeah, it was rough. How many kids did you have at the time? Um, two, three. We had four at the four time. Kids. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, um, Margie was pregnant with our fifth wow. at the time. Uh, so I had a, I had an inclination. I had a desire to understand politics better. And it's sort of my nature. I decided to just jump in with both feet. I mean, I, I could have done anything. And so I decided to jump into politics, and so I hired on at, um, as a um, fundraiser for a big U.S. Senate race up in Montana. We moved to Montana, oh. and uh, I found out I had a bit of a knack for fundraising. And and I've told some of those stories, and I can tell a bunch more. But uh, after the campaign was over, the um, state party, um, Montana GOP, asked. Uh, hired me to be the executive director to get them out of debt. They had some debt challenges and I knew fundraising well. And so I said, I didn't really want to do it uh, for a lot of different reasons, but I said, okay, I'll do it for six months and get you out of debt. And it was great. We walked in with about $60,000 of debt, walked out and they had a hundred thousand dollars of reserve in, in the bank account. That's so awesome. six months later, it was, it was a That's good, great. Deal. yeah, it was a good deal. But I, I, after that I started, I, I said, oh, well, I like fundraising. So I started a firm that did fundraising for nonprofit and political organizations. And, and what I had found through the campaign stuff is um, when you combine telemarketing with direct mail, I, I figured out a sequence there that maximizes donations, yeah. right? And, um, and it's pretty cool. So you call, you get the donation, you send out a reminder letter, and then you do a follow-up call and two more reminder postcards and um, and then you have a simple way to do it, and it it explodes revenue. It's just it's really incredible. So um, we we serviced um, the the model on that was we had all of our I had a dream of having all of our staff home based, right? I wanted everybody home based, and so we were using this way crazy new technology at the time called Voice over IP. Right, and so <laughs> you're always early to early adopter. Yeah, this stuff. Yeah, I am. So long and the short of that is, is we had 30 callers. Um, we had five employees running the mail shop and sending out letters and whatnot. A um, couple managers trying to manage everything. Came into the office one day. We and we were using a hosted solution for the voice over IP. So our callers would come in, sit down at their own computer, put a headset on, log into the system. The system would dial the numbers for them, and they would make the calls. Right. Yeah. So as as automated predictive. Sounds dialing. great. Yeah. It was cool. It was really great. Um, I didn't quite learn all of my lessons. I, you know, I didn't overextend myself on capital, but what I did do is, and this time I trusted on an external source of new technology. Uh, one day the caller, uh, on December 3rd of that year, that would have been 2004, December 3rd of 2004, um, I got a call from my call center manager saying, hey, nobody can get on. What's the deal? I said, I don't know. They said, I called our contact over at the uh, call center and, and I'm not getting anything. So I said, okay, let me call. So I called the direct desk number of the, my contact over there and I got the famous do, do, do. The number you reached has been disconnected. That's, wow. It was un unbelievable. So the, basically that company, for whatever reason, I still don't know, basically folded their doors, shut everything down and walked away. I didn't tell anyone. Yeah, we called one day and they were they were out of business, and uh, so I had I had, <laughs> it's 
So I had my whole system banked on this call center and it went under and it took us under. Um, I, I would have needed, again, because the technology was so new, I mean, I would have, you needed a, nobody else did what they did. I would need a huge infrastructure to rebuild it. Right. So we I paid mean, everybody how, out. How can you really, uh, you know, do things differently at the time? Like going back, would, what would you have done? Um, I probably would have slowed the rate of growth down and invested in internal hardware systems, you know? Um, the other thing that I did, which was really, really stupid, um, is I, to fund, to initially fund it, I got an investor again and the, uh, and I, I did a personal guarantee on the investment, which I don't recommend to anybody, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, so when that thing folded, you know, I was saddled with close to $200,000 of personal business debt. Wow. Yeah. Well, um, the, the, yeah, it wasn't all from that one investor, but it was, you know, a combination of some things. So again, poor financial management. And, and you know, when I say like all those, I knew that there was weird stuff in my head about money, but I couldn't quite get rid of it. But that's what you're seeing here. Right. That's what you're seeing here. It's just little tiny business decisions that lead up to these major failures and uh, that, that, you know, cost me a lot of money, a lot of money. So how do you get past that now that this happens? That's, that's a difficult time also. Yeah, that was a tough time. Um, so we went, that was in December and coming around in April of that year, um, I got a letter from AWAI and they, they train copywriters and teach people how to do direct response marketing. And um, they essentially said, look, you can retire. The, the promise in this letter was retire this year and make more than most doctors if you can write a simple letter, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, I can write a simple letter. You know, I had never heard of copywriting as a market Well, you've been doing this all along, it sounds like, with the fundraising I mean, I, and, yeah. and everything. Yeah, yeah. So there's a backstory there for oh, sure. Oh, for sure. And, um, but I had never, interestingly enough, through all that 10 years of that, you know, I basically just took you through 10 years of business practices, right, and, and, and efforts. And in all of that, I had never heard the term copywriting or copywriter, yeah. right? Like, and then there's this company that sold this idea of copywriting. So I'm like, oh, well, I've been doing this. I can do this. <clears throat> so, you know, long story short, I basically, I, I jumped in and... Um, and I didn't get an investor. I didn't have any overhead. I just, I just was a one man show, just marketing myself. And, um, and I did, and I did very well. I made a strong six figures the first year. And, and I've, for 10 years, I've had an increase in income every year. Okay. A few, few times, some key points. I've had quantum jumps you know, just massive leaps in income and, uh, others. It's been a little more uh, slow moving, you know, based on what I've yeah. done, but. So Joshua, what's what's been talk about some of the milestones? Yeah, milestones. Um, I think I think a huge milestone clearly for me was um, that that copywriting letter that I got. I, I think we could say some big milestones were the you know the major failures and, and the right. lessons that I learned from there. Um, but clearly, some of the big milestones yeah. were. I mean, once you started in copywriting, that you knew the term copywriter and copywriting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So once I got past that, I did very well for the first two years. Then a major milestone was meeting RC Peck. That was a big one. And why that was so big is because an interesting thing is the first year and a half, I did very well. Um, no overhead. I was making a couple hundred thousand dollars. It's fantastic. And I started okay. doing, and I started doing little stuff to sabotage my income at that point. And like I saw what? these same patterns. What was something you do to sabotage yourself? Firing clients, good clients, like, you know, missing deadlines, uh, not communicating clearly with them, uh, you know, writing shoddy stuff when I knew better, you know, turning things in last minute, you know, li little things along the lines that was hurting my income and my reputation, right? So I saw these things start to crop up and I thought, man, I, I got to fix this. So that's when I hunted down RC. And um, RC helped me really understand major powerful um, stuff about what was going on inside my head, okay? Yeah. And one of the things that I learned from RC was is that when we, um, when we, let, let's tell you two things. I think all of us operate within it, what's called a safe harbor, okay? 
And I didn't understand this before. And so what happens is, is inside of us, we have pre-programmed sensors that say, you know, you're, you're good enough to make this much money or, you, or it's safe to make this much money. And all of us have these safe harbors. And so we see people that get in bad relationships and they get abused over and over again. Yeah. And as screwy as it is, being abused is safe. They know they can survive it. They know how to cope with it. They know how to deal with it. So they yeah. keep coming back to it. Right. Alcoholics are the same way. Why do they keep drinking? Because they know how to deal with life as a drunk. They don't know how to deal with life as a sober guy. You ever seen the movie Tintin? Uh-uh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great, great kids movie. So Tintin, one of the guys in there is this uh, sea captain that's been drunk all of his life. He gets stuck in the desert. Doesn't have a drop. Doesn't sound like a kids him. movie. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and uh, and um, he, he gets stuck in the desert. And he, he's like, freaks out. And he's like, what's wrong with me? And Tintin says to him, you're sober. He's like, ah! Anyway, so he freaks out. <laughs> so, so people operate within safe harbor. So we never operate outside of the safe harbor. Yeah. We can only expand the safe harbor, right? And so RC gave me a set of tools, very specific tools to help me expand my safe harbor and to realize that it was okay to make, you know, more than a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. That was fine. I could survive that. So that was a huge milestone. That is huge. Yeah. Another major milestone. Wait, that before you yeah. say that, what's one thing that you did to get out of that, to get your head out of that safe harbor? Yeah. So one of the things that I did, and this is a cool exercise that he had me do, is yeah. he said... What you need to do is you need to validate through association that other people are surviving and enjoying this level of income. Mm. So I joined a couple of mastermind groups and he said, what I want you to do is I want you to go sit and I don't want you to listen to what's going on. I want you to watch the person and I want you to observe that they're breathing. Just watch their breathing. They're living, they're alive, they're surviving. And then talk to them about their personal life and, and get a sense of, you know, are they happy? Are they surviving? Are they comfortable? Do they have good relationships? Mm -hmm. And then start validating that in your own mind and reprocessing that. And, uh, and it did. Because again, I grew up in a family that was always in financial crisis. And I thought that was safe. And mm -hmm. I was always told having money was bad. And people are miserable when they get a lot of money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so I remember um, one of the guys that I went and sat with was a guy named Rich Sheffrin. And I remember sitting in Rich's office and he's telling me some cool killer marketing strategy. I'm not listening to a word. I'm just watching his chest breathe up and down. I'm going, Rich makes, you know, a couple million a year and he's breathing. And I talked to him about his family. He keeps a journal with all the cool pictures of his family and little, you know, stuff like this that his kids make for him. Like this is a little cool little thing my daughter drew for me. And he's got all that inside this little book. He carries around with him all the time. He's got great family relations. He's just a good guy. And I remember sitting there thinking, like, it's so outside of my paradigm to see this guy, great life, breathing, surviving, happy. Mm. And it allowed me to shift some of my thinking. So that was one really fun exercise that I did. How did you choose the mastermind or the mentors? Because then you have to go out and, you know, you don't want to go with the wrong, like someone could be really well off and not be happy or not have a good right. family life. So how did you actually end up choosing that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I did what you're doing right now. I did interviews. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, un under the, like, uh, you probably won't laugh, but under the guise of putting together different marketing reports and, and uh, systems, um, business systems, I would call and interview people. And during the interview, I'd talk about their life and what they do and who they are. And, uh, and I fell in love with guys like Rich Sheffrin and, and Perry Marshall and uh, Bob Bly and some others out there. And I just thought, these are real people. They, they're just great people. Yeah, for sure. They're not perfect, but they're just good people. So. Yeah. All right. So I interrupted you. You were going to tell me the next milestone after RC yeah. Peck. Yeah, next major milestone. One of the other things that RC had me do um, is a daily accountability process and tracking um, six things. And while I was getting the, and I'll tell you about the six things in a second. While I was getting the head trash out of my head, is that did you coin that? I think that should be a book or something. Did you coin head trash? <laughs> yeah. Is that uh, is that I've never heard that. Before. I, I've never heard I, that before. I don't know. I, I I don't know where I heard it. Okay. <laughs> That's your trademark now. Maybe so. Yeah. We'll, we'll we'll say that I we'll say that I created it. Yeah. Um. So what I did was is I I spent about a year and a half working on that stuff, and at the end of that, um, I had a huge leap of income. 
And the, the second thing that I did is, is I went and I, I created an accountability program for myself. And basically how that worked was, is I chose someone that I really respected in my life. And every day I would send them an email at night or at the end of the business day, and it would have six things on it. I'm going to do, and it would say, basically, I'm going to do these six things tomorrow. Wow. And um, these are the six things that, I, this is what I accomplished on my list from yesterday, right? And then every morning, 7 a.m., would jump on the phone, and it was a live call, not an email, it was a live call. And basically, that, you know, my person, this particular, uh, his name was Randall, Randall said, would say to me, okay, let's just look at your goals. And he would question my assumptions, right? He would question, hey, Joshua, so one of your goals is, you know, to get this many clients by the end of the month. And uh, like, you have no marketing stuff on your list to do today. Like, what's the deal? Right? He, and he would just, it wouldn't hammer on me. He would just question my yeah, assumptions and right. I'd have to be accountable. He says, hey, you got six things on your list from yesterday. Um, you didn't do any of them. Like, what were you doing all day? Right? <laughs> Well, you know, the dog, I, but, uh, whoa, hey, you know, I don't need to hear all the excuses, just like, right. you know. So, How do you those, find someone like that, to be honest with you, but not, uh, you know, not let you off the hook? Yeah. Um, was this a friend or was it just a colleague or how did you choose Randall? Yeah, Randall was actually somebody from church that I had a lot of respect for. He had a lot of weight in my life. He was not a business associate. He was kind of detached from business world, yeah. my business world, per se. Yeah. Um, I, I think the critical thing there is, is finding someone that you have, um, that has a lot of weight in your life. Right. And is, that and is you not, respect. Yeah. Yeah. That you really respect. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's lots of, lots of people out there. Um, everybody's got somebody like this in their life that'll spend five minutes on the phone with you. And we did that for a number of months and man, again, massive jump in my income because, you know, going back to that simplicity and focus thing, yeah. it forced me to, and, and some people say, well, why do you do six things? What's with your list of six? Yeah. Well, the list of six is psychologists say that the human mind can focus on or, or manipulate somewhere between seven and 10 things at a time. And when I heard that, I thought, you know, I'm not quite as smart as the average guy, so I'll <laughs> only do six. <laughs> True story. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. So I was like, if, if most people can do seven to 10, I'm going to do six. And I just focused on the six things that started right. number one and work my way down. Yeah. Um, by the way, that's an interesting, um, where's my little notepad? I'll draw something for you. It's yeah. just popped into my brain, but this is a cool lesson to learn. One of the things that I learned when I was actually listening to him, one of the things I learned from uh, Rich Seffrey, let's grab a pen, a little marker. <clears throat> um, Rich, Rich talked about the process of focus, and uh, I'll just draw this out for you. So I don't know. I better, let me um, just make sure I'm in the camera. Oh yeah. So let me show this. So, yeah, I can see so it. Four ABCD, boxes. D, A B C D. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what most people do when they're working on various projects and companies operate the same way, right? So this is a big thing that company, I, I counsel companies to do this and they don't, they violate it and it costs them a lot of money. So what most companies do is, is they will look at all their different projects and they'll say, okay, we're going to allocate some resources to A, B, C, and D. And they've got all these resources and they're funneling some stuff in here. So they'll allocate a little bit of time to this, a little bit of resources to that. And that what they're trying to do is they're trying to get multiple things done at a time, Right. And, and you see individuals do this and other people do, and, they, and we call it multitasking nowadays, right? Yeah. Super stupid. Very, very stupid. Because what happens is, is when you do that, you're always, every time you skip from one box to another, there's a minor learning curve that goes on. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. And so there's a regrouping and a reprocessing. Yeah. So what Rich said, he says, far better. And, and by the way, um, debt reduction people know this thing too. This is this, like... Um, uh, Dave Ramsey talks about the debt reduction snowball, exact same principle of synergy that goes on here. So what he says is, instead, focus on the project that you can knock out the fastest, call it job one or project A, mm -hmm. devote time, resources, and energy to that, and then take that momentum, those resources, those finances, and allocate them over to job B, and then C, and then D, right? Yeah. Um, the uh, uh, Earl Nightingale talked about this principle where he says, um, 
You can get to any harbor in the world. If you're a ship captain, you can get to any harbor in the world, but you can only go to one harbor at a time, right? Right. right. Or there's that old expression that says you can, you know, the hunter who goes after two rabbits gets none. Right. Right. right? Yes. Yeah. So, so what you see here is, is this focus. I don't even remember how I got on that. You can get me back on track. But, it, but um, you were but, just talking about the accountability. Yeah, and the, the daily accountability. And what, yeah. So that that process of having six things to do, I would stay focused on the first one until I got it done, and then I'd move on to the second one. Basic, simple time management yeah. stuff, and then I'd have someone hold me accountable. Yeah, that's powerful. Uh, I mean, like you said, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy to do. Yeah, yeah, huge, huge, simple, and uh, very, 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 very powerful. So, and so Joshua, the next milestone yeah. involves Perry Marshall. Mm. So, at one point, I got very excited about understanding what Perry Marshall understood because I could see he was doing cool stuff, and I really liked him. I wanted to be closer in his world. So, he did a little contest um, where he was uh, hiring, bringing onto his team a content czar. Well, I won that contest, and I got brought on as content czar. As part of that, I went to what he calls his four-man intensive groups. And it's basically, he brings in, any, any business owner in the world should go to uh, Perry's house and do this. He brings you into his house. You got four businesses represented, two days. Everybody gets half a day for everybody to just tear your stuff down, rebuild it, and reorganize it, et cetera, okay? So I was Perry's content czar, and I also had my own company, my own business that I was doing. I wasn't a full-time employee. I was a contract guy with him, right? So we're sitting there and I'm in this four man intensive, right? And I'm listening to this other guy who ran a, a natural health thing, so Be Beautiful, I think is the name, beautiful.com, B E U T I F, you know, B U Beautiful. Anyway. I got you. Okay. Gotcha. All right. So, so <laughs> he's sitting there talking about some of his marketing strategies and things that he did and opt in stuff and this, that, and the other, right? And as he's talking, it was like, I had this daylight vision. I, I, can't, I can't even explain. It was like this waking vision, right? And all of a sudden, like all these fragmented pieces of the marketing puzzle, all this stuff that people have been doing to me for years, getting me to opt in, you know, commitment and consistency, social proof, having, you know, sending me these emails, following up, the price point strategies, testing messages on me, you know, all these different kinds of stuff. What I call, what I now call salting the oats. And I'll talk about that in just a second, but all these different things there, right? And all these pieces that were scattered in my brain and kind of loose and, and not really gelled together. Right. As these guys are talking, tearing apart, um, his name's Todd, Todd's business. He's tearing apart their business. Like It was like they peeled the curtain back. <laughs> and all the pieces started assembling. And right in the middle of his presentation, I went, holy cow. Everyone stops. They're like, you got a problem, Boswell? Like, what's the deal? I'm like, Perry, oh, oh, oh my gosh. Like, it, I get it. I see what they're doing to me. I see what they're doing to me. Like they bring me into this funnel here. They do that there. They go to this. They got this piece in there. There's this up there. There's this one. So like all these different things. And the whole thing starts coming together for me. Right. And it was like major revelation to how human persuasion and psychology works. It was major revelation on how you get people to move with you and to collaborate with you and to buy stuff from you and all that kind of stuff. And suddenly, instead of being the consumer, like I had been a marketer and selling stuff for years, but I had always kind of done it from a consumer vantage point. Now suddenly I stepped behind the curtain and I was seeing things, I was seeing the whole picture of what was really going on. And uh, by the way, on a, on a fun side note, I, uh, I took all of that and created a product for Perry. I don't even know if he still sells it, but um, I, we, he and I created a product together called Next Step Marketing Guide. Okay. And it basically laid this all out in a spreadsheet, um, you know, puzzle format that puts all the pieces into place. And, you know, there's lots of different ways to market, but this was pretty fun. It was cool. Um, but that was a huge turning point for me. And so I, I took that, to give you a quick story. I took that and I had a client who was in the Forex business at the time. He was taught people how to buy and sell and, and trade Forex online. And he was doing he was doing a modest, I think, if I remember right, twenty or thirty thousand dollars a month in revenue, right? And I, I took that, I went back to that client and I said, We're gonna restructure some stuff. And so we restructured his funnel based on this, you know, stuff that I had seen in my head. And literally within six months, we he went from that twenty thirty thousand dollars a month to cranking out almost two hundred thousand dollars a month in sales. Wow! And why? 
we just restructured his funnel. We restructured his message and we like put important pieces into place. Uh, I'll tell you another guy who's killer at doing this is Ryan Dice. Ryan Dice is awesome at that whole funnel, if you know Ryan at all. Yeah, yeah. So, was it something specifically he said or was talking about that made you have that epiphany? <laughs> I don't even remember. I was like, you know, I had been thinking about it and noodling on it and, uh, I don't remember if there was a specific it was just, it just came together at that time. Yeah, it just came together. Yeah. Perry talks about that because I like stood up. I interrupted everybody. I was like, ah, I was a madman. <laughs> they thought Hallelujah. either he's really smart or he's crazy or both. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so Josh, what was the next major milestone after the epiphany with Perry? Yeah. Next major milestone. Um, I got to a point in my career, um, where I was, um, I started realizing that I was only a decent copywriter and I, I was at an event one time and I was um, emceeing and I got off on a tangent and started speaking about something and afterwards I had a few people come up to me and say, man, you were in your total area of genius and I did an exercise that I recommend everybody do. I sent an email out to um, about 30 of close friends and I said, will you tell me best things that I do. I mean, what's something that I do that's better than anybody you know? Yeah. And I I had been in copywriting now for like seven years at this point, right? And I thought, oh, they're going to say I was a great writer. Do you know nobody, not one person came back and said you're a great writer? <laughs> really bugged me. <laughs> <laughs> it was like hurt my ego. But what most of them said is you're an awesome communicator, especially live. Yeah. And when you speak from stage and we do stuff. And so um, this past year, I, uh, early in the year, I made a decision that I was going to start speaking more and fine-tuning my speaking skills and my sa- stage presence and selling skills and whatnot. Yeah. And um, this past year, at the end of the year, I did a 90-minute speech, 90 minutes, and we sold over $550,000 wow. worth of stuff in 90 minutes. That's amazing. To a crowd, get this, to a crowd of about 120 people. It was almost an 80% close rate. That is remarkable. Yeah, it was a seventy-five hundred dollar product, and um, you know it, it was awesome. So what I found is is that when you step into your area of genius, now I haven't given up copywriting by all means, right? But what I what I'm finding is, and I've tested this a number of different times, and I'm going on this tour that I just told you about. Yeah, yeah. But what I'm finding is is when you step into your area of genius and and you really focus and play to your strengths your ability to generate revenue is exponentially higher than when you're only doing things that you're good at. When you do things you're great at, it totally changes the dynamics, right? So, um, you know, I, I, can, I can get up and do a couple of speeches. Like, for example, this tour that I'm doing right now, we haven't sold out all of the locations because there's a bunch of locations coming on. But literally in a couple of months, I'm going to make more in those couple of months speaking for one day. So I'm basically going to speak for eight days, I'll have a day of travel, so we're talking 16 days of work in the next two two weeks. Two weeks. I'm going to make more in those two weeks than I made in the first eight years of my marriage. That's a remarkable (laughs) statistic. (laughs) Right? Like I said, I I, I sat down and calculated. I'm like, I'm going to, and and it's a lot more. You know, if I did the math, it's probably more than I made in the first 10 years. I'll I'll do the math exactly, but for sure, in the first eight years of marriage, I'm going to make more in two weeks of effort. Now, why? Because I'm catering to that strength yeah. and, and all the things that I know. Yeah. So, yeah. It's like an overnight success after 10 years or 20 years, though. So, exactly. Yeah. Isn't that great? Yeah. yeah. I only had to work 20 years to get that overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it is. That's So, you know, we did talk about some of the most successful campaigns. Just reiterate, what, what are some of those most successful campaigns that we didn't touch on? I know you talked about the the coral segmentation, the Silicon Valley formula. What's another successful campaign and why it was effective? Sure. Um, so There's one a of the Toshiba cli- one. Yeah, yeah. One of the clients I had for a while was uh, Toshiba. Toshiba was trying to break into um, the creative space inside of universities. You'll know that most universities use Mac products and have for years, especially in their creative departments and with their laptops and whatnot. So Toshiba wanted to break into that space. And um, what we did is we created a folder, and uh, this folder was like a, a like a mini shock and awe package, to use Dan Kennedy phrase. And basically, we had a sheet of testimonials, a sales sheet, a, a product spec sheet, um, you know, a benefits list, and and um, a couple of other pieces. 
And, and all we did is we focused on content they already had existing, but we changed up the headline, the lead, and the close, right? And, and using some of the techniques that I've already talked about. And they, they had awesome, awesome success. They were able to get contracts with about 40 major universities that they hadn't broken into before. Oh. And, uh, and, you know, which 40 universities is a big, big, you know, it's a big chunk of change when you're selling them a lot of hardware from Toshiba, right? Yes. And so they considered it to just be an awesome, awesome success. Um, another major campaign, and I've touched on it a little bit, was, was a company that where I did the... Um, let me just write, draw something else out here, and um, and this is okay. This is what I call the pricing grid, and and this will just help to summarize um, what it is and so why this campaign works so well. This represents dollar, and this represents product type. So down this side of the grid, you've got dollar amount. And down along here, you've got product type. Pull, push it up a little. Pull it. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So dollar and then product type along the product horizontal. Type. Yeah. 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 So we can use a quick, simple example. We can say, okay, for every product and service that you offer, you should have stuff that goes along, um, you know, vertical and horizontal axis on this particular grid. Yeah. So it is an example. Apple started out with a thing called the iPod, right? So if we put iPod right here, you put iPod right in the middle. iPod was a certain dollar amount in a certain product category, right? Mm -hmm. And then what they did is, is they lateraled over product type and they created what they called the iPhone, okay? And then they lateraled vertically up and down with different price points of the iPhone. Make sense? Yeah. And so Apple is constantly moving this way and this way on the product grid, okay? So what I do with clients is, is I sit down with them when they've stagnated a little bit, and, and this is what this particular client technical lead was going on with them. What happened was is that they had a certain they had a bunch of products, but they're all basically in the same price point, right? So they're running horizontally across the grid. So what I said was, let's offer those same types of products, but in different segments, right? Yeah. And what we did is we immediately tripled their revenue. Why? Because we were moving people. And by the way, you can plot this out, and you can look at your customer segmentations, and you can say, okay, who's buying a certain price point? We can offer them more price points. Then we can offer them an offer to skip up to a different product type, right? Right. Right. So yeah. if you, again, not to get too complicated, but if you, you plot where your customers are all at on this, you plot out all your products and offerings and you plot where your customers are at, yeah. then you look at strategies of moving people this way and this way. And you Smart. can, yeah. when you do that, you can simultaneously, literally you can triple or four times your revenue streams because there's a propensity to buy inside that grid that you're not tapping into yeah. yet. I love the way that visual way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the, some of the campaigns that didn't work? What's a campaign that didn't work? And why? Yeah. So let me tell you, I'm going to tell you a group of campaigns that didn't work. Okay. okay. Um, for a number of years I was involved with technology. I was involved with, um, the nonprofit political organization. Um, and you know, some of those other spaces and <laughs> biz op was a big one. So I, I saw a bunch of my fellow copywriters making a ton of money writing for the financial industry, financial newsletters, publishers, et cetera, and the health industry and doing really, really well. And I got a little greedy. I'm like, man, you know, that'd be great. I could charge higher fees. I could get better royalties. You know, like, oh, sweet. So I, so I jumped for a couple of years. I jumped into that world and I wrote uh, about 30 or so different promos and campaigns. And some of them completely bombed. In fact, one of them, like the client didn't even publish the stupid thing. They were like, this is just terrible. We're not going to even send this out. Surprised. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, uh, and the other ones just did mm, okay. You know, not great. And so what happened there? Well, I can tell you exactly what happened. And that is... Um, all of us bring a unique set of talents and gifts and strengths to the table, right? And it's folly to think that we can be all things to all people because we can't. Because, you know, there's a real chemistry that goes on between a buyer and a seller. Yeah. You got to know, like, and trust the person. You got to be able to forge those bonds, especially in copy. If you can't forge the bonds, then it's no go. There's no sell, right? Yeah. And that was my problem. I'm, I don't, 
I'm not a big numbers guy and I'm not a financial world guy. I'm just not. I did have the one success with RC Peck, but that was off of his strength, not off of mine, right? Right. And so what was happening is I was catering to a weakness and trying to strengthen it when I really should have just been catering to my strengths and not worrying about that, right? Yeah. So I spanked myself and slapped my hand, <laughs> <laughs> said, bad boy, and I repented, and now I'm catering more on my strengths. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, so I'm going to skip. Um, I had a few other questions about, we talked a little bit about crafting a story and about some of the big mistakes, but um, <clears throat> I want to get into, you know, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask the question, and we talked a little bit about it, but um, about your lowest moment. Yeah. And then how you actually pushed forward through it. Yeah. <clears throat> um, by far and away, the lowest moment in my career, so in the last, you know, what I would consider 20 years of, of career and business development, by far and away, the lowest moment was when that... Um, company folded when we lived in Washington, the, the technology company. And um, even more so at that time than when my political fundraising company collapsed. And one of the reasons was is because I, I had so much of myself wrapped into that. I was fragile as an individual. I didn't, I was, you know, our marriage was having a really tough time. My wife was, you know, very, very stressed out about having no money. And there's just so many pressures coming down that I didn't know how to deal with. And I remember one night, um, the night after my Cadillac got repossessed, and, the, and we lived in a little cul-de-sac and the neighbors watched it drive away on two wheels, you know, really, that was always fun. Like, oh, what's going on over there? Oh, man. Um, and I remember, I remember it was about three o'clock in the morning and I'm laying prostrate on the floor, just crying, sobbing, wow. and just thinking like, What's the deal? Why can't I be somebody? You know, I've disappointed my wife. My kids are, are we're having a hard time putting food on the table. We're getting kicked out of our house. My car just got, you know, repoed. The electricity is going off. Like I'm the biggest freaking loser ever on the planet Earth. And I and I just did not it was very 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 hard time for me. And so, you know, I'm like just having a hard time. And and that hard time stretched out for about 6 months to be honest with you. Yeah. You know, follow up on that. We moved in with the in-laws. I kind of morphed into a nothingness. I wasn't really the head of my own household anymore. It was like, it was really, really hard. So how did I get out of that? Yeah. The most valuable skill that I learned through all of that is what I now call a high-definition mar marketing plan or micromanaging steps. And and I probably picked this up. If you remember the, uh, um, oh, what's, I just forgot the name of the movie, but he talks about baby steps, you know. It's not Groundhog Day, but it's the same guy in it. Um, anyway, Bill Murray, you're talking about? Yeah, 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 Bill Murray, and he talks about you know baby steps, and he's got the psychologist, and he's got to take baby steps here and baby steps there. Anyway, I realized that my problem was is I was looking at the whole big problem and all the things oh, that were overwhelming. Going on. Yeah, it's completely overwhelming, and I couldn't digest the whole thing. And so what I started doing is I started breaking it all down in small steps. So let me give you an example of this. I tell you a story about how this works. What happened is, is um, years later, and, and this, I, I got this analogy years later because I had money to do this, but years later, I went on a cruise with my children. Now I have an inherent fear of heights, right? And on the back of this cruise ship was like a 40 foot rock climbing wall. And, you know, and it sits up there and it doesn't really hang out over the ocean, but it feels like it does, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and my kids have no fear of heights. So they're like, oh, let's go climb the rock climbing wall. So they go down there and I'm watching them. And then my little kids come up to me and they're like, oh, dad, we climbed the rock climbing wall with me. I'm like, no, <laughs> dad. Okay, I will. So I just said, look, can you just put the harness on? Yeah, I can put the harness on. Can you put the helmet on? Yeah, I can put the helmet on. Can, you know, can you go stand beneath the wall? Yeah. Can you hold on to the, you know. And So what I did is I looked up at the bell and then I pictured that in my mind. That's the end goal. And then I just looked in front of me and I just looked one little step ahead of myself and I tore that wall down into little one and one and three inch increments. Right. That's all I did. And that is a perfect analogy. By the way, I got to the top. I survived. I rung the bell, you know, and I'm still here to tell the story. I didn't fall into the ocean, get eaten by sharks. None of that stuff happened. So to me, that was the perfect analogy. Whenever I face complicated, hard things, I break it all down. When I first started copywriting and made those 
cold calls. I was scared to death of cold calls. So yeah. what did I do? I broke it down into tiny little steps. Can you dial a phone number? Yeah. Can you say hello? Yeah, I know how to say hello. I can say hello. Can you ask a simple question? Do you hire outside writers? Yeah, I can ask that question. And if they say no, can you hang up really fast and not be embarrassed? Yeah, you can do that, right? So I broke everything down into these tiny little micro steps. And that has been a major, major part of me overcoming tons of head games and tons of problems and tons of crisis in my life. Yeah, yeah. that's powerful. I like yeah. that. You could yeah. use that for anything. Oh, yeah. And I have. <laughs> Joshua, what's been the one of the proudest moments? Um, there's been a couple of proud moments. One of them has been uh, a few years ago when we had seven children. My wife was very tired. We put the children into a private school. Well, I didn't know at the time, but the private school was cavitating financially. <laughs> I tend to attract these things in my life, right? And so I went to the board of directors and I said, look, I just barely got my kids in this school. I don't want you guys to go bankrupt, so I want to help. And so I put together a campaign. I wrote some sales letters for them. I gathered up some major donors. I, so I used all of my skills there. And um, we tripled the enrollment of the school, wow. saved the school. And, uh, and it was a really proud moment for me. My fee for that was, well, getting my children in there. I donated priceless. all. Priceless. We'll call it, it was priceless. priceless. It yeah. was totally priceless. So that was a super cool moment because I saw the joy on my wife's face. I saw the joy on my children's face. There's a fun follow-up story to that too, by the way. Um, and I'll tell it just real briefly. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of the kids in the school was there because they didn't fit into a regular school. Super high energy, very creative, you know, very eccentric, just did not fit into a regular school. Brilliant kid. And um, in the middle of all that, sadly, his father died in a plane crash. Oh, my gosh. So um, I, a number of years later, this kid's like does great. He's super successful now. You know, this has been a few years later. He's in a great college. He's moving on with his life. He does very well. But I got a note years later from the, his mom talking to me, thanking me for helping to save the school and explaining how the school system had been a huge support for her. It had been rallied around their children and helped them to emotionally deal with this. There's, you know, there's the friendships there, the academics, the structure. And, uh, you know, she really thinks that her family just would have been very, very hard off. It's devastating. Fact, totally devastated. But that school was there. And I, so I helped save that school and it was a really big deal. One other moment that I'm super, super proud of. Um, or, you know, um, I, I went through and had a huge, I pushed through a bunch of fears and had great um, growth in income. And one of my rewards, I'm a big gamification guy, by the way, too. I love games. And so I've always got games going on and rewards in my life. And one of the rewards that we had was to go on a cruise. Well, same cruise on the rock climbing wall. So went on this cruise. And uh, instead of just going on the cruise, I wanted to do something cool for my family. So we invited my grandmother, their great grandmother, to go with us. Wow. Paid all of her expenses. She'd never been on a cruise. And uh, we just covered all of her expenses, flew her out to us. We spent a few days with her and then took her with us. And uh, man, she still talks about it. It's got pictures. It, you know, it was just awesome. It was, oh, wow. it was super cool moments. So That's I'm, really special. I'm very proud of it. Those things are way, I mean, I love the, I love the successes um, that, that I've done and uh, the tens and hundreds of millions of dollars that I've helped clients earn and raise. But for me, the reason I do all that is for those yeah. cool moments. And that's fact. what it's all about. Having your great, yeah, their great grandma spending a trip, oh, man. time with a trip. Totally. With them. Oh yeah. 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 Josh, this has been fantastic. I can go on and on for hours. Uh, you have a meeting now, so I appreciate it. Where should we point people towards to find out more about you? Yeah. Joshua Boswell.com is sort of my mainstay site. Um, I, uh, uh, I've got another entity out there that focuses on some of my speaking, um, which is uh, buyerpatterns.com. So joshuaboswell.com and buyerpatterns.com. Both of those are places where you can find out more about We'll link those stuff. up. Thank yeah. you so much, Joshua. I really Thanks. appreciate it. This has been fantastic. Yeah. It has been fantastic. Good luck to you, buddy. Bye.